this is a big area of what I call se uh, some secret suffering in this country. There are a lot of people that are in a lot of pain because of what they've gone through with religion. Okay, so it's uh, actually uh, not uh, as uh, unusual. Uh, let, let me stop you there, because that, that's interesting. That's what he seemed to be saying, that the religion had caused him this pain. Um, it's not any religion or any Christianity. It's this particular insidious kind of fundamentalist Christianity. Persevering grace, and that is this, that if you really are a Christian, you'll be a Christian for the rest of your life. You won't fall away from Jesus. Life will send us some tsunamis. The waters are going to rise. And the only thing that will keep your house from devastation is having built your life on the rock. There is a conception in Christianity that when a believer is overwhelmed by adversities or tragic life situations, it may cause them to give up or turn away from God. Or as Jesus is attributed to saying, their house of faith is swept away by the storms. When I look for the storms in my own deconversion, what I find is something I knew even back then. Nothing was wrong. I had made fatal personal discoveries, and I was slowly bleeding to death. Faith is a totality of Christian identity. To lose that is to lose yourself. I remember this overwhelming sensation of not being able to envision the future, of continuously feeling like I was less than I used to be. And when the plane hit the towers in September, in caring for others in response, it was one of the only times I felt release, because the meaning of my life in that moment was shifted outside of my relationship with God. I agreed to see a doctor, even though I knew this wasn't medical, and she told me something that I didn't fully understand until years later. What I was experiencing was trauma. Trauma is usually associated with disasters, or abuse, or war, like the Vietnam veterans who led the cause of having PTSD recognized. When you come back from something like a war, you are never the same. But what if trauma could be experienced without these external events? What if it could be just as powerful in a form of inner violence? Do you think it is possible to make your own trauma? Unable to continue as president of InterVarsity, I quietly resigned and retreated to a shattered place on the outskirts, attending meetings but disconnected from the fellowship. An outside observer would have never known I was the leader of the group a semester before, wrapped by distrust as if my friends were also my enemies. I would spend nights wandering, inconsolable and brokenhearted. Liam told me he was having recurring dreams where we died. He and my roommate Rick were doing very badly, and I knew that part of this was because they looked to me and saw what I was going through. One night I was trying to find a friend, and a girl saw me in the stairwell and started asking me over and over if I was okay. She said I looked like I was going to commit suicide. All of the beauty in the world was being lost in a darkness I had never experienced. I was still leading the youth group with Liam and some friends while my stomach dropped out before every meeting, so afraid to lead the songs or be asked to pray or give the talk. So afraid that I couldn't be a Christian for the kids in this group, who by this time I loved in ways I never knew that I could. Most of all, I was afraid that it was only a matter of time until I couldn't do this anymore, that I would be found out. Before youth group, I got there early and like every week sat down in the back of the sanctuary trying to hold on. I looked at my wrist and my camp bracelets and I felt like God was showing me he had called us to be leaders for those kids specifically called to love those kids. Liam came over to me and said, he's coming back someday, and wept on my lap while I stared at the other wall with my eyes burning. I got to Elm Street when I couldn't go any further. Everything was crashing on me. At the university meeting, I curled up by the garage doors and prayed pretty hard. Then I couldn't go back in. It was paralyzing. Others came in and wanted to get upstairs, but couldn't because Liam was sobbing in the way, and I had to move him. I looked at Liam, and I saw Rick and others with heads down struggling at the meeting, and thought, normal people don't do this. Where has all this gotten us? 
It was my turn to do the youth group talk. I went in the sanctuary with Liam. He sang a prayer he had written for me. Afterwards, we started talking, and I lost it. I turned away from Liam. He told me to look at him, but I couldn't. I told him I had to leave the youth group. I was prepared to go in there in front of the kids and tell them straight up and leave forever, out of love for those kids. I could hurt them all at once or hurt them slowly over time by staying. I started thinking about a kid and telling him I couldn't be around him anymore because my life was so messed up. What I meant by messed up was my relationship with God coming undone, was a sadness I couldn't overcome, and I was so scared I would spread this to others and cause them to go through the same thing. I went back to my dorm to call my old Young Life leader Mike to tell him what I was about to do. I was holding the phone in my hand, gathering the courage to do it, when it started ringing. When your life is threatened, by illness, by loss, by anything that would try to take away who you are, a natural response is to look for deeper meaning. In a perfect storm of timing, my meaning came in that moment. I answered the phone and it was Larry, a Young Life leader I had met in high school. He had never called me before. We talked for hours. He couldn't understand, but somehow he moved something in me, telling me how much Jesus loved me and that I needed to look at him. I went to Liam's room in the middle of the night and told him I needed to stay, because the best example I could set for my youth group was to keep following God even when my life made no sense. For the youth group talk, I memorized the story in John of the man born blind, who was healed when Jesus spat on the ground and rubbed it in his eyes. The Pharisees grilled the man, demanding he admit Jesus was a sinner because he had done this on the Sabbath. But the man insisted, and finally in desperation they cried out, You are completely born in sins. The message I gave with the story was about when everyone and everything in your life is telling you that your relationship with God is no good, and how Jesus said to look at him. The other leaders one by one took me aside to tell me how much it had impacted them, and one of the kids prayed to receive Christ with Liam. I had reached something deep inside of myself. Maybe this could be okay, but it wasn't okay. The following week while I was leading a song, I looked over at a kid and I saw him put his head down between his knees, reflecting what I did at church. It was like looking directly at myself. I left, but I couldn't bike home. I wrote on my I Am Away message these words from a song about Jesus. It felt like my heart had been torn out. Affection is a human connection, and I wasn't just a youth group leader anymore. I had been seeing a counselor, despite how wrong it felt to be paying someone to help me through what following God got me into, but I was reaching for anything I could. He was a pastor, and he told me miracle stories from his life like the time he raised a man from the dead. He told me I was a hopeless case like Peter, and how wonderful that was. He made me pray with him, even though I told him that would violate what I felt. And finally, after several meetings, he told me that I was wrong, that God was true, and someday I would know it. My friendship with Liam was deteriorating. He was hurting me, and it was as if he was using my love of God and the youth group to do it. And I was defined by my relationship with Jesus and the pain it caused, focusing on Jesus so I could overcome the pain and have a relationship with Jesus, a circular existence of emotional destruction, and I never saw this for what it was. All of these things were converging into a single life mission, to defeat the deconversion, that I would somehow come through this and it would mean something important. What I never saw coming was struggling to find it meant anything at all. As opposed to PTSD, which can be caused by a single event, complex PTSD is caused by long-term interpersonal trauma in the context of captivity or entrapment, with little or no hope of escape. Some of the symptoms are persistent sadness, a sense of being completely different from other human beings, distrust, and a loss of meaning. I had tried talking to so many people, there was nothing they could do, and so much of this I did alone. I would try to express to God what I was going through, and I would get so upset at what would come out when I did that. The momentum of the youth group was building. More and more kids were coming. Without sleep or time, I pulled the spring lock in together, and I shared stories and led songs. Another kid accepted Christ. 
And I remember this night I was biking home and these words were shooting through my head. I am a liar and I've devoted my life to lying to kids. And so I did what you do when you are a young guy facing adversity. You grow up. As my relationship with God broke away from Christian concepts, it became more personal. The mission had become a mission impossible, and I was going to do it. Modeling Christ while protecting others from Christianity. I strapped a sleeping bag to my handlebars and biked 40 miles in the middle of the night while the rain turned over to snow so I could be alone with God. I slept in a field, and in the morning I found the church of the pastor I had counseled with the summer before. I tried to talk to him. He couldn't help. He didn't even remember my name. But I was being pulled, and I knew what I had to do. Holding my heart while the pain would race through me, I did what I could to stay with my community. This was my community. I was plugging the youth group summer camp trip to Penile, even though there was no way I thought I would be able to remain a Christian long enough to make it there with them. I was a counselor for 12 weeks last summer, and the week I went to Penile was by far the best and the most impacting in my whole summer. And, you know, I was getting so excited about Penile that I just decided that I should write a story about it. I was asked by my church to give a talk about worship, of all things, but somehow I said okay. We had just sung Heart of Worship, and so I talked about the irony of singing a song about how it's not about the song, using the blind man story from John to talk about worship, and how awkward it would have been if the man had worshipped Jesus by singing him a Matt Redman song. That worship is a position of the heart. I meant so many things under those words. I confronted Liam about the night he told me he saw Jesus two years before, because I had to know. And this time the story changed. He told me he didn't actually see Jesus, just lights from angels. And then I remembered a year ago when he had mono and his pancreas was failing. I realized it probably wasn't true when he had told me Benny Hinn healed him through the TV. It might not have even been true his pancreas was failing. So much was unraveling. And my friendship with Liam had become harmful and was reaching a breaking point. After the last youth group meeting of the year in May, I went out with Liam. I was overcome by emotion from what I had just finished. And I told him, I just spent a year leading kids in what I didn't believe. I went home and took this picture because I wanted to remember that night. The kids in my youth group didn't need an image. They needed heroes. And somehow I had done that. I had done what I had to do. And this could have been the end of my life as a Christian. I was ready to accept that it was over. But a few days later, everything changed. I lost Liam in an abrupt way I never imagined, as I found out something I couldn't believe was true, putting pieces together through layers of lies about God and other people until I finally knew what happened. I lost a friend. I lost my other half as a youth group leader. And I lost a witness. Having someone see your experiences gives them validation. In the way that God acts as the enduring witness, a friend is a microcosm of this. And Liam had witnessed more of my struggle, more of this story that isn't supposed to happen than anyone. I would think of my young life leader, Mike, wondering if I could be like that guy as my youth group went through this. Suddenly, Liam was someone I needed to protect others from. And sometimes when I think back, I wonder if we didn't create so much shame and fear through taboo, if he could have talked to me and it wouldn't have happened this way. Because most of all, it was deceit, not the action, that did the real damage. Disaster can make you push away from your relationship with your conception of God, or it can make you cling tighter. And when this happened to me, it pulled me tighter. I felt moments of being in love with God again, not in the same sense as before, but in a way that was life-defining. I had to make this right. I called Aldersgate just before camp started and asked if I could come back. And so I was a Christian camp counselor again. To imitate Christ, to stand for truth in a world full of hurt, even to death by people who didn't understand who he was. I biked off every night to a bridge to pray and punch the guardrails. And all of this fear, all of this mission, was separating me from kids that I loved when they needed me the most. The letters that I wrote that summer, the ink would smear from the tears on the pages. I took my youth group to Penile with the help of a special mom from the church who stepped in to take the place of Liam. But I was setting myself up to run away from everyone that I knew. <laughs>